Okay, there we go. So, uh, we're almost there. I, I unfortunately had no idea we were not meeting on Wednesday, and then I had to cancel on Monday as well. But I think we're going to be okay. So if you watch this lecture, it's going to set you up for Friday evenings or afternoons lecture. And then we'll lecture maybe once next week. And we should be good to go, okay, with the final being the following week. Uh, probably at the end of Friday's lecture, I'll be able to walk you through all the steps necessary to do the latest homework that I posted on uh, D2L yesterday. I also gave you an extra credit. Actually, after today, you could probably work on that extra credit if you wanted to do it. And finally, I was going to make one other comment. What was it? Oh, yeah, I went through and I graded most outstanding homeworks. I do have your big uh, your big assignment where you did the seismic analysis on the structure. I still have to grade that one uh, and just kind of look through and see how you guys did on everything. Then I have to update your scores for your exams but I have uh what have I done here I updated your scores but then I have updated the d2l page to account for um the new uh distribution of uh points basically I got rid of the project right that was worth 15 percent of the grade so then I took and distributed that basically added five points to each exam and then five points to the homework. And so I just kind of smeared those, those points out amongst everything. So, uh, all that stuff is on D2L, Everybody did great on their homeworks. Yep, I think we're just progressing along. So, to, uh, we're getting there right in the final grand finale, right at the end of this, I want to be able to show you kind of the basics or the basis behind the modal response spectra analysis, which is a method that is allowed by uh, ASCE to do a seismic analysis. And in some cases, it's even required, right? If if you have a torsional irregularity and things like that, you, <laughs> you get bumped outside of being able to use equivalent lateral force procedure, and then you have to use modal analysis, right? Uh, there's also a time history analysis that also is permitted by ASCE 7, and I'll briefly talk about that as well. And actually today, that's kind of where we're going to get to that. So that's kind of what we're building up to. So where we, where we were at, at the end of last lecture, let's kind of go back to this. So we kind of did free vibration, your homework's on free vibration. I think you got a pretty good understanding. You go into modal space, you solve for cues, which is your modal displacements. Then you bring it back into the real world, real world by multiplying your cues times your fees. And that's how you come back to the real world. And then you add up all those and it gives you the total response. Okay. Now, Right, that's all That's all good, right? So then we said, okay, what do we do when we have a forcing function, okay? And that's where this 4.2 was. So if we have a forcing function applied to the structure, what we're building up to is when we have ground acceleration. So that could be, it's going to be similar to, it's going to be similar to having uh, these forcing functions applied. But if, and in particular, what we're going to focus on is a special case where that forcing function has the same time varying part. So an example here would be three cosine of omega t, one times cosine of omega t. So right, this time varying part is constant for the top and the bottom, very similar to how the ground accelerations are going to be constant for the top and bottom. But then there's the spatial distribution, which we, we which we account for with this s vector. So you have this s vector that tells you the spatial distribution of it, and then you multiply it by p of t, which is the time varying part. Okay, so if you have a special case like that where you have the same time varying part, but then the spatial distribution is different, then you can use the method we're talking about here. So we introduced this vector called S, which tells you about the spatial distribution of those forces. Um, and then we said, you know what, you could take the space, right, we're going into modal space and we're solving this thing in modal space. So I could take this S and, and look at its modal components, right? I take that force and I break it into its modal components. Just like the displacements are broken into modal components, I'm, I, need to, I need to take this over into modal space. The way I take it into modal space is using this gamma, okay? And so this is kind of, you know, the definition of it. Say where your total S is going to be and adding up all of your modal components of your, your spatial distribution, right? After you've broken into the spatial distribution. Well, how I break it into a spatial distribution is with this gamma, okay? Gamma I times M times phi I will then tell me what my modal contribution is to the load, okay? And so, 
I need gamma in order to do that. I get my gamma either like this, or the easiest way to get it is in matrix notation, like this down here. This is kind of in matrix notation how you calculate all of the all of your s's at the same time. It's using this, and so if I want my gammas, I just you know inverse. I hit this thing with an m to the negative one, then I hit it with a big phi to the negative one, and then I multiply that by s, and it gives me my gammas, and then it gives me the gamma for mode one, and the gamma for mode two, and mode three, and mode four. So once I have those gammas, then I can come back up here and I can break my s up into its modal components an example of that just briefly so this is for a one two three four five five uh, degree of freedom system i could take this is what my load is it has you know a load of one at the top times cosine would make it some time changing part times one well i could break this into its modal components i would do that by first calculating what my gammas are once i get my gammas then i can hit my gamma times my m times my phi i and then it would give you these so that would be phi that would be s1 then i do the same thing i come back up here and i hit this with gamma 2 m times phi 2 and then it gives me this right and i keep going with it as i go along and so there's the modal distribution of that load and so now my loads are for each one of these things okay and this is just another example of doing the same thing when you have two and one so that's kind of what's happening there right and that's kind of yeah we're going into this modal space we've broken the load into its modal components okay so then we come back to this we come back to this uh, right you come back to this differential equation and we're going to substitute so we're going to do we're going to hit substitute this in for u right this goes in for u that goes in for u dot sorry this goes in for u double dot this goes in for u dot this goes in for u and then you hit it with a big feed transpose we've done that a bunch of times before and then carry that thing through okay we substitute in this into here and then what you get is this okay where this is just big m you take you take the whole thing you divide by big m or i guess this is a diagonal, that's pretend diagonal, that's diagonal, this ends up being diagonal. So this whole thing works out, and it's an uncoupled system at this point. So it's uncoupled, and if I divide by, by my big M, psh, okay, then I end up with this equation right here. And then if I substitute in this new thing called D, big D, which is big gamma times big D is equal to Q. Sorry, so I, I, I've introduced this new variable, which is gamma times D gives me Q. So if I take these and I substitute them, well, I guess these, and I substitute them in here, right, into those three things right there, then I could cross out all my gammas, and what I end up with is this. Okay, and this is kind of one of the key components here. So I have in modal space, I have a differential equation that's equal to a forcing function, the time change, the time changing part of the forcing function. And this forcing function is the same for every mode, right? There is no, there is no gammas or anything. This is just straight up P of T. So, so in, in the example we had before, there are up above, this was cosine of omega T, right? When that was cosine of omega T, well, then that's cosine of omega T for mode one, for mode two and mode three. Right for all the different modes, it's equal to the same thing. Right again, setting us up for that forcing function to be the ground accelerations. Right, right, because that is going to be a constant for all the different modes. Those ground accelerations. So now we've got an uncoupled system of differential equations. Right, and my differential equations that I'm solving for are my d's. Okay, and then once I get my d's. And then once I get my D's, once I solve this differential equation via any method you want, right? Uh, what we're building up to is using a, a, a numerical method for solving this. But if it's if it's a certain type of forcing function, we can solve this differential equation, right? If it's cosine of omega t, I would know how to solve. I would know how to solve that. Okay. Anyways, there's that differential equation. Now I got to come back into real space, okay? And, and and there's one extra step to do. I have to get my cues first. I get my cues by multiplying by my gamma. So I take I, your, what you get out of this, right? You get d as a function of time out of this, right? That's when you solve a differential equation. That's what you get is what this equation is for d. So I get d as a function of time. Once I get d as a function of time, right? I then multiply it by my gammas, right? And then it gives me q. Once I get my q, I take my q times my phi. I take my Q times my phi, and I get my U, and that's for the mode. And then to get the total, I just add all those things up. Okay? Beautiful.
it's kind of a neat little way of like breaking this thing down, right? It's not, you know, what you actually do when you solve these problems, you don't have to do all this. It's just kind of demonstrating how the math works and stuff. What you end up doing is you kind of jump right down to here. You solve this differential equation. Once you get that, you're going to have your gammas lined up and then you, then you take your Ds, then you multiply it by your gammas, you multiply it by your fees, it gives you your Us and you sum for your Us and you get your total response, okay? That's what you would end up doing. The other thing we did is, is the book spends quite a bit of time on this. It's this idea of of, you know, I want to figure out, right, you need to be able, I need to be able to put into my structural analysis program, these forces, the reason I need those forces, that's how the structural analysis programs are, are made, right? You give it forces, and it tells you what the moments and shears and axial loads are all over your structure, right? That's how you go about designing it. You don't give it displacements, what you do is you give it forces, okay? That's how all this, this stuff is set up, is, is you give it the equivalent forces on the side of the structure, and it analyzes it, and and so we need to do that. We need to set this thing up so we can give it these forces and we can get these responses out of it, okay? One way to do it is you just take your stiffness matrix times your U. You got your U up here. You take your stiffness times your U and it gives your forces a function of time, okay? And you could even break it down into the, the different modes. If I want to figure out what's happening in the forces from each one of these modes, I just say Q times UI, just not, not the total U, but the UI, this component of it, right? This is UI right there. And then I could get what these forces are for each one of the modes. And then the total forces is I add them up. Okay. That's one way of doing it. What the book does, it takes a step further and it does some substitutions and, and, and works its way down. And what it ends up with, and this is equivalent, mathematically, this is equivalent. Instead of writing, you know, force is equal to K times U, it, it writes uh, it like this. W I, or sorry, omega I squared times M times phi times gamma right, times D. And what that ends up being, by doing the substitution, well, this, this part right here ends up being S. And so what you do is you pull the S out and put it out front, and that's, that's kind of the static response, and you multiply it by the dynamic amplification. So that's the dynamic amplification, and then that's the static response, okay? And so what they said is, oh, look at this, right? If you're trying to run this on a big analysis, and you're trying to figure out what R is as a function of time, instead of solving this this whole system at every single time step, I could solve it once at the beginning, right? I just, I put in my S's, right? That we, that we, it's the modal distribution of those forces. I, I load my structure up with just my S's and then, you know, I calculate my response in a certain location, right? One time, I do it one time. And then that response then gets amplified by the dynamic response that's the di this is changing with time and this is the dynamic response and so i just in the dynamic response comes from solving this this single degree of freedom system right when, when you solve this equation right here right that's equivalent to solving this system right here Okay, so you solve this, and what you get out of it is d is a function of time, and to get what my response is as a function of time, I just take that and I multiply it by this dynamic amplification, omega squared times d, and it gives me the thing. So this is changing with time, but you've only run this once. And so mathematically, right, or computationally, it's way slicker to do it this way. I run this once, and I amplify it like this, and this will be going up and down and up and down and up and down, and, and it, it, you'll get the whole response as a function of time, and it's just computationally better. How, do they do this in VA? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they do this in VA or not, right? With how fast computers are and stuff, they might just, they might just come like this and say, okay, I, I'm just going to figure out what my, my, total U is, and, and you don't really need to break it down into its modal components, and so I just take K times U, right, and U is changing with time, and so I set up my forces right here, and in those just K times U, and U is changing with time, and I just run this whole structure over and over and over for every time step. I'm not sure what PA does. I think it's really slick to be able to break it down into the components, but again, I'm not sure what exactly uh, uh, VA does. And I should talk to Adam and see what it is that they end up doing there. But it's n n needless to say, it's kind of a neat way of picturing this. You have a static response and then you have a dynamic response. Okay. So, and again, it gets kind of convoluted what's happening there, but but hopefully you're, you're picking up what I'm putting down. It's not too bad. Really, you just kind of jump down to this. I'm going to do an example at the end of this. Uh, we're going to go by hand. 
do a response spectra analysis, a modal response spectra analysis for a three degree of freedom system. That's kind of what we're going to do on Friday and next week. Okay, so you can kind of see how all this pieces together. And then what you'll hopefully see is that when you model it in VA, that you'll get the same exact answers or pretty damn close to it. Okay, and that's what your homework seven is. You try to model that same three story structure that we do by hand that way. Okay, so now what do we do with the ground excitations? Okay. So we are, uh, right, we, that's what we've been building up to and I'm telling you what we're doing. So what happens when you have an earthquake, okay, and then the ground is shaking underneath it, okay? Very realistic thing, right? That's what we're, we're building up to in this, in this class. This is kind of like the grand finale of stuff. So what do we do, right? And, and what, when we have ground excitations, what you get, right, what you start with is UG double dot, right? That's what we mean by ground excitations. This is... The ground starts shaking, and it gives you those uh, accelerations at the ground, okay? So what it ends up being, and pretty straightforward, the differential equation that, to, that governs this is this guy right here, okay? We say that, right, mu double dot plus cu dot plus ku is equal to this, okay? So this is the standard that we've been using, right? Where m, these are matrices, Right, these are vectors as we go along. Now we get to this right here, and so let's talk about this component right here. So what this is, it's negative because that's what we derived before. But it's m times this little guy right here, which is iota. That's the Greek letter iota times u g double dot. And so this is what it's setting up to is this is going to be a fixed component, and this is a time changing part. Right, so depending on Right, so this is very similar to the S component that we had before. We have a mo we have a distribution of forces, right, or or a distribution of things that will be affected by the ground shaking, times a time changing part. U G double dot is the time changing part. Okay, and so we, let's talk about this iota here. Okay, there's a Greek letter iota. Iota. Okay. And what it is, it's an influence vector. Okay. Equals iota equals 1.0 when degree of freedom lines up with ground motion equals zero and DOD, I don't say degree of freedom Line up does not line up perfectly with ground motion, or that's a, equals zero when degree of freedom. I guess he does not line up at all. That's a, that's a better explanation with ground motion, and equal to something between. Zero less than iota less than one for cases not okay. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about that. I'll 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 give you some examples down below what I mean by that. Okay, so iota. Okay, it's, a, it's what they call the influence vector. It's equal to 1 when degree of freedom lines up with the motion. It equals 0 when the degree of freedom does not line all the way up with the, with the ground motion. And it's somewhere in between if it's not perfectly aligned. Okay, so what I mean by that, let's look at this example down here. Right? So in this case right here, 
I have my structure, right? And then we're going to model this thing as this thing is moving to the right with U1 and it's moving to the right with U2, right? Right or left, right? So these guys, it's a, it's a two degree of freedom system and these guys move back and forth like this, right? Similar to our shear frames. I probably should have drawn this as a shear frame. It probably would have made, because you could see, yeah, there you go. It should probably be a shear frame. The reason it should be a shear frame is so that it, if it's just a cantilever, then this thing could go down when it when it rotates to the side. But with a shear frame, it's going to be held kind of constant in, in just those directions. So anyways, and this guy right here, ooh, let's line up, let's write what UG double dot is. Right, UG double dot, when you talk about our ground acceleration, it's actually shaking back and forth this way. Is there some ups and downs? You bet. Okay, but we don't, that's accounted for with that vertical component. We don't actually model that in our in our models. Most of the motion we're going to get is is sh shifting back and forth like this. Okay, so in this particular case, when you have your motion right here for your degrees of freedom, u one and u two, they both line up perfectly with the ground accelerations down right here. So they're both influenced directly by this ground acceleration. So in this case. I get one and a one, right? Because they perfectly align with the ground accelerations. So my iota would look like that, okay? Now, in this case over here, so if you had a system like this and you have, you're going to define the d displacement of this mass over here with a right displacement and a vertical displacement, in that particular scenario, right, our UG double dot down here at the bottom, my UG double dot, right? It lines up, right? My UG double dot lines up with U naught. So U1, sorry, UG double dot lines up with U1. So in that case, that gets a one. But then U2 is how we're defining it as U2. That's pointed up like that. And so it doesn't, it's perfectly not aligned with UG double dot or not at all is what I was trying to say above, right? This one's going back and forth and there's no component of UG double dot that's in the direction of U, U2. So in that case, that gets a zero. So that was what your iota would be for that, okay? If I had something like this where I have, right? For some reason, there's no reason why you couldn't do this. I could set up my displacements to, you know, for the same system, I could set them up being like that way and that way. In that case, right, only part of it, the ground accelerations, again, is going this way. Only part of my ground accelerations line up. Okay, only part of them. And so in this case, for U1, it's 0.707, right? This is, if, assuming this is a 45 degree angle. Okay, and then this one would be negative 0.707 because that one's going to the right and it's tilted back to the left. And so it'd be negative 0.707. So uh, that's your iotas, okay? Where those iotas go, right, are in here. So you take your mass matrix, you multiply it by iota, and it's just whether or not that mass and that degree of freedom lines up with the ground accelerations. If they line up, it's a one. If they don't, it's a zero, right? Or if it's somewhere in between, okay? So the book spends some time discussing what these iotas are, but it's an influence vector. How much is that degree of freedom affected by the ground accelerations underneath? Right, and you could imagine if you had a multi-story structure and you had six degrees of freedom, right? If you had a, uh, you know, a full-on frame, right, three D frame, right, right. Each one of these nodes gets, each one of those nodes gets three or six degrees of freedom rotations, rotations and displacements in all three directions on each one of those things. And you can see that ground shaking in one of the directions isn't going to affect some of those degrees of freedom where it is the others, especially the rotations, right? It's not really going to affect the rotations. It is going to affect the, you know, it's not going to affect the vertical displacements, the ground shaking laterally, right? And so somewhere behind the scenes, VA is going through and, and formulating a, a influence vector, okay? On whether or not it lines up with or doesn't and then, and then works its way through that. Okay, so then, uh, so then what it is, so this is, I mean, it, it basically what it ends up being, this ends up being the same as what we just got done solving. That is the same as this whole system up here, right? You have a spatial distribution times a time changing part. Come down here again, I have a spatial distribution times a time changing part, okay? So this is analogous, they're the same thing, 
Okay, so you do, we don't have to go through the full derivation of these things at this point. Okay, but what we're so let's just make a statement say treat the same as previous section. Okay, so we're going to treat this thing the same as the previous section. All right, which just means you know we're kind of going to skip over the full derivation, but but it is the same method, right? And that's kind of what this is going down. So, okay, well, S now in this case, that spatial distribution is this M times times iota part, okay? Just M times iota, I can break into its modal components. Just like the S before we broke into its modal components, I can take this M and I can break it into its modal components too, right? And I could say, well, the total S is going to be the modal distribution, right? The summation of the modal distribution of these guys right here. So I can I can come up with a new SI. The SI is just going to be gamma M times phi I, right? So again, I need to figure out what gamma is, right? How do I get gamma? Well, I come back down to this full definition right here, and I pre-multiply by the inverses of these guys right here, that's what this is doing right here. And then it gives me my gamma. Once I get my gamma, I can take my gamma, plug it in up here, and I break this this, this, mo this mass into its modal components. What we're building up to towards is this idea of a modal mass, okay? Because that's what we do is, is I break this mass distribution into its modal components using this gamma, and I get my gamma from this, right? So then when I do that, Right, so you take that, and then I'm going to put a dot, dot, dot. So this is you, if you went up above the page above and followed through the exact same derivation. Uh, if you followed through the exact same der derivation, you would see. I mean, it, it all it all works out. But what you would end up with is this. Okay, you go through the same. What I mean by the same derivation is this whole thing. Right? You come back up and go through this. You do the exact same thing. The book actually starts over, and they do it. They, they, they do it first for the spatial distribution of forces, then they do it for ground accelerations, and they go through every single step. We're going to put the dot, dot, dot. You don't have to see the whole all the steps. But really, ultimately, what you end up with is a decoupled system, okay? You have a decoupled system with, you know, gammas out front. Again, all these gammas, right? You can divide by gamma, and, it, and what it simplifies down to is this single degree of freedom system, Okay. So when we run this, right, so when we go through doing this, right, what you're going to do when you when you go to solve this is you're first going to go through and you're going to say, okay, I'm going to I'm going to figure out what my mass matrix is, what my C matrix, well, well, not really the C, because again, it gets with non-classical damping, or classical damping, things get weird there, but I'm going to figure out what my mass matrix and my stiffness matrix are, I'm going to figure out what my iota is, my influence vector, Right, and then I'm going to enter into this into this realm here. And what I one of the first things I do is I break this m times iota up into its modal components, right? By first solving for what gamma is. Once I get gamma, then I can break it into its modal components by multiplying my gamma. What this is, right? This is gamma one, then it's a gamma two, and then gamma three. So it stacks them like that. That's what this this vector is. So then I pluck off my gamma one times my m times my first mode and then that is the modal distribution of what m iota is right and then you do that for each of those modes so now that once i'm in there okay once i'm in there and i've got my gamma then i come down and i solve this differential equation right this is a differential equation that should have a negative i lost my negative in here somewhere doesn't it won't make any it won't make any difference but really there should be a negative out front there Okay, and so that's a differential equation. It's uncoupled, and I solve this for each one of those modes. Okay, the other thing, uh, I kind of this is somewhat displaced, but but the same thing can happen here too. Is I can I can take, and, and what you're doing when you're solving this is I could take out the static part and I have the dynamic part as well, and then the total response is the the static multiplied by the dynamic response. And then again, this is basically the same graph as we used before, except for now, no, there is no P of T applied to it. It's just a ground acceleration, okay? And again, what's interesting about doing it this way is these are all equal to the same ground acceleration. So I'm solving this differential equation equal to the same ground acceleration, right? If I didn't do this gamma step, 
then then there'd be this there'd be a scaling function out front and so i would be solving it for something that isn't equal to the same thing for all modes so that's one of the key things on how this work is they every mode has the same forcing function in this case it's ug double dot and so we solve that so let's talk about what i do at this point once i have that i come down and i can solve this thing two different ways so uh this is the difference between a time history analysis and a response spectra analysis okay so Ultimately, I'm in my modal space, I'm deep in my modal space, and I have to solve this differential equation. Again, should be a negative here. I have to solve this differential equation for uh, each mode. Okay. Well, how do I solve this differential equation? Right? It is, I, I do not have a closed form solution to it because UG double dot, right? If, especially if we're talking about earthquakes, that is a very random thing. So I cannot solve this via a closed form solution. So I have to use a numerical method. Okay. Or I can use the response spectra. So this is, this is the two difference, right? Code lets you do both of these things. If I want to do a time history analysis or what the book call or the code calls response history analysis, I go this route. Okay. If I want to do, do a modal response spectra analysis, I go this route. So let's talk about this, this direction first. If I want to do a time history analysis. So basically what happens is I have to solve this differential equation. It's a single degree of freedom system, right? I mean, it, in the mode, it is a single degree of freedom system, right? But it's a single degree of freedom system with its UG double dot. So here's the forcing function right here. This is UG double dot. So this is a random forcing function that's applied to this thing. So then what I do is I solve this differential equation using the central difference method, using the new mark method, using something like that, and you'll do it for each mode. So if I go through and I, I'll do it once for T1. Oh, I guess these are going backwards. This would be T1, I think, your biggest period. Right. So I would go through and I would solve this thing let me put it over here. So this would be for the first mode. And I would give it also uh, a, right, it'd have what our damping ratio was. So I start out and I give it that, right? I give it omega one. I give it row one. And then I go through and I, and I solve this thing with the central difference method. And so what this would be was D1 as a function of time. So I solve this thing at every single time step, given a T1 and given a row one, right? You have... You have this built into your code already, or you have a code that does this, right? Let me say right here. Method. Method for oh, die for each mode. We get the function of t okay I mean, you know how to do this and, and in fact you've 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 done this right right you, you you've set this up to give it a period and give it a row and then it returns to you those displacements so that gives you d that would be d1 right here this would be d2 Right, so then you run the same thing. You run through your central difference method. Okay, you run through central difference method. This is for B T two and row two. Right, in our cases, these are all going to be the same. The same damping ratio for each one. And this one right here would be for T three and row three. And you would run through it. And what you get out of it was D three as a function of time. So you have these displacements as a function of time. So in your code, if you're, so that homework that talked about doing a time history analysis, right? That's what your, that's what the extra credit homework is. Literally all you do, right? Is you, you got to do a little stuff up front. You have to calculate what your, what your gammas are. And then uh, you have to calculate what your gammas are. You got to figure out what your masses are. There's a little bit of little work to go out front, but really what happens is you get down and right where you had your, you, where you solved for Q of T, you said Q of T was equal to, you know, it was, it was Q naught times cosine of omega T. Instead of making that be the answer, you do, you slip in your central difference method, 
right? You slip in your central difference method and you solve it for the forcing function of what the ground accelerations are. And what you get out of it is you get your D, right? You get your D for each one of these things, right? For each of these periods, you'll get a D as a function of time. So you'll get this whole thing for D1, D2, and D3. Once you get the D1, D2, D3, then you have to come back out. You got to come back out of your modal space. And the first thing you have to do is this right here. I'm going to take it and I multiply by D. That gives me my Q. So I take my gamma times my D, right? And then D is a function of time. And that gives me Q as a function of time, right? So now I have Q as a function of time. Then to get my displacements, I do my mode shape, Vi times Qi is a function of time. So this is this is the spatial distribution. This has this has the, each floor built into it. I take those floors and I multiply it by this time changing part. Qi is a function of time, which is just gamma times these responses, and then the total responses I just add them all up. Okay. So if I take my right, this is the modal contribution for each one of these guys, right? And my total is going to be this guy plus this guy plus this guy, right? multiplied by their gammas, multiplied by uh, their fees. And so I, you take and just add them up. And the reason you could just add them up is because I have every single time step. I have U at every single, or I have D at every single time step. And then, which means I have Q at every single time, time steps, which means I have my modes, I have my displacements from each mode at every single time step. And so I just add them up. And so what your U's would end up being would be this, right? I would have there's my axes right there. I would have what floor one is doing. Right, floor one is doing something like that. Right, up and down. I would have what floor two is doing. That's that. And then I would have what floor three is doing. As every at every time step. So this would be. Uh, this would be, you hat. No, sorry, you 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 bar. Right? That's what my total response would be. And then these are what I use to calculate drifts. This is what I use to calculate. I take these, multiply it by my Ks, and it gives me my... Uh, I take these and multiply my k's and it gives me my equivalent forces and I use those forces to calculate what the modes and or what the, the moments and shears and stuff like that are. Okay, And so this you could say f as a function of time is just equal to my k vector times my u bar as a function of time. All right, and I could calculate what all those forces, once I have all those forces, then it would lead, lead me to my, what we're calling the responses, right? right? Depending on what it is that we're after, moments, shears, or whatever. So that's kind of a slick way to do it. So the, so the code allows for that. It's called a, what they call a response history analysis. They've got a bunch of rules associated with this, like in particular, one of their rules, the little complexity gets added in, is what do I use for this earthquake, right? Do I just use El Centro for everything, right? This is the El Centro earthquake. Do I just use El Centro for everything? Well, that doesn't make sense to do an El Centro in, in Bozeman, Montana, right? And so that's part of the code goes around is like, well, how do you, how do you go about selecting Right. The, you know, when we, we talked about doing the equivalent lateral force procedure, there was a bunch of steps involved. Right. There was the USGS went through and said, what's the likelihood of there being an earthquake? What's the soil conditions like? What is the, you know, the importance of the building? Right. And then it tells you what the response vector is that you have to use for that. And, and, and the, you know, likelihood of being an earthquake, how big the earthquake is going to be. All of that was taken into consideration by USGS. So you can't just go in and just pick some random earthquake. You actually have to go through. And, and do some, uh, you have to run response spectra analysis on a bunch of different ground accelerations and then target what their design spectrum is. But we'll cover that a little bit later. So a lot of, in order to do the response history analysis, you have to pick the right ground accelerations and then you have to scale those ground accelerations so that they work in your, in your, uh, uh, in your region for your model and stuff like that. Okay. And so that's the response history analysis. Right. And it's done. This response history analysis is done using modal analysis. That's how we you you could do it in your homework. Right. We break it into its modes. Right. We break it into its modes using a numerical method. And then you bring it back out of its modes using this method right here. And then you solve the whole the whole system. Right. 
I don't think that's what VA does. I don't think it breaks it into its modal components and solves each one of these things. Since you're solving this thing numerically from the big, you know, since you're solving this thing numerically anyway, I think they solve the whole system. There's methods for solving coupled linear systems, sorry, coupled differential equations via numerical analyses. And I think that they don't break it into their modes. I think they solve the whole system from the get-go. I think they go back up to that coupled system and then they solve that coupled system at every single time step. But uh, but in order for you to implement it, doing it this way works beautifully. You break it into its mode. You solve the single degree of freedom in its mode using central difference method, which you already have the code to do. And then you bring it back out into the real world or uh, you know, into real displacements like this. Okay. So that's one way of doing it, right? Response history analysis. The other way to do it, like I said before, is using the modal response spectra analysis. And so... If you recall how this thing was made, right? So this is our, our this is a response spectra. This is a design response spectra. How this was made, or or how something similar was made, was by by you come over here to this guy right here, and what we did is we said, okay, give it a period. We're gonna give it, you know, we'll give it a certain period, and then we're gonna go through and then run the analysis, and then we're gonna pluck off the max. So you can see the, I, I took this from our notes on that, and you guys made a response spectra, but that's what you did. You, you run it for a certain period, you pluck off the max. You run it for another period, you pluck off the max. You run for another period, and you pluck off the max. And then what you do is you plot those things on a graph, and you end up, I mean, really, it ends up something like this, right? But what we, what the code does is it simplifies it down to this, okay? So this kind of already does this, right? This kind of already does this. If you have a response spectra, you don't necessarily have to solve this at every single time step because this is also an answer to this, okay? And so the way that you do this is use your response spectra over here. So the first thing you do, right, you know what your omega i's are. Those are your, your circular natural frequencies. You get that from your eigenvalues and your eigenvectors. And you calculate what your period is for each one of your modes, and so then you can come in and say, right, because, uh, again, just make it clear, th this is the answer to this for all different omegas is really what the, it, this, is the, this is the answer to this for a bunch of different omegas. And so once I have my period, and so I should also mention this is this, what, what's on this axis is what they call the pseudo acceleration, which is just omega i squared times d. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. Making a mess here. Come on. Anyways, that was a lot of work just to do a little thing. But but that's what it's on this axis, is that's A on that axis. Okay, and then what's on this axis right here, I probably should have put these on here, is what your period is. Okay, that's how those things work. So what I do is I come in, come back over here. Yeah, I'm ca I've calculated what my mode is, or what my period is for each of my modes because omega i is we get from, those are the uh, eigenvalues. And then what I do is I come in and I say, okay, well, for T1, that's the higher period. As I read this thing up like that, and I hit there, and I read across. Okay, so this would be T1. And it has an A1. Then I do this again for, oh, I'm going to change this color. Okay. And this is A2. This is for T2. And then T3, maybe it's over here. I'm going to make that a different color. T3. So then we read across to there. A3. Okay. So then now I have, when you do that, now I have, right, what the pseudo acceleration is for mode one, pseudo acceleration for mode two, and pseudo acceleration for mode three. Okay. And I just pluck them off of this curve. Right. And then, so then now I've got what those pseudo accelerations are. If I'm trying to get displacements, if I want displacements, I then have to take that and I have to divide by omega i squared, and that'll give you my displacements. And so that's what this is saying right here. It says, all right, di is just going to be ai over omega i 
omega i squared. So this is my pseudo acceleration divided by omega i squared gives me di. And note that this is only, this is just a scalar. It's kind of key here, scalars, because over here, when I solved for d, d was a function of time, and so d was all of these points. Now over here on this side, d is just a point, right? Right? It's just a1, one number. Then for mode 2, it's just a2, which is just one number, and a3 is just one number. So you do not have, oh, that should be, hold on be right at the top. Okay. I don't know why it's going down there a little bit, but you get it. Okay. <laughs> I erased it and then drew the exact same thing. I can't do it. Oh, I got it. Nailed it. Okay. All right. So that's, these are just scalars. And then again, once I have D, I have to bring it back out to the real displacements. So I take my Q, I got to get my Q first and I get my Q by just multiplying my gamma times this D that I just got. And then I get my U, my modal displacements. This should be a vector. I get my U vector is going to be equal to my phi vector. Oh, that should be phi I times Q I. Okay. And so what this is, right, so this is a, this is a vector, it's not changing with time, because this is just a scalar, 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 and then this is just going to be a vector of three numbers, okay, this is going to be, right? this is just to make it clear, this is going to give me, Clear scalar, scalar, scalar for like a three degree of freedom system. Okay. And then you're going to get that for each one of the modes. Okay. So then at this point, right over here, what I did is I said, once I got my UI as a function of time, I then just summed them up. If I wanted the total displacements, I just summed up my, my, displacements like this, right? I just said, okay, well, I have this as a function of time, and I'm just going to add them up, multiplied by their fees, but I can just add them up, because I know every single time step. If I come over here, though, I cannot just add them up. The reason I, so, because right now, these are just your, U, the UI is the, your displacements from your mode. I cannot just add them up. The reason I cannot just add them up is because these maxes all happened at different times, right? D's the maxes, right? Or even the A's are the maxes. All of those things happened at different times. For example, right? In this example that we have over here, right? This one happens at about 12 seconds, right? That one happens at 12 seconds. This one happens at about five seconds. And this one happens at, this peak over here happens at, you know, two seconds. So I cannot, I cannot just take the mode one plus mode two plus mode three, because this happened at a time, this happened at a different time, and this happened at a different time. They did not all happen at the same time. Therefore, I cannot add them together, right? It gets, this is one of the huge downfalls of this, this method is how do you go about combining the modes, okay? You cannot, let's, I should have given a little more room, right? How do I, how do I combine the modes, right? And, Let's see if I can put this into words. I can't simply add them together. Because maxes from response spectra occur different times during response. Okay, hopefully that captures it, right? And, and again, just to reiterate what I was just saying is that, right, this peak, this peak, and this peak all happen at different time steps, 
okay? And so I can't just add them together. Here I can add them together because I have every single time step and you're just adding every time step just like this vertically down like this and you can do that. This, you can't. I'm cherry picking. I'm picking which, which points. I'm just picking out the maxes from over here, okay? So now I got to combine these things in some way, right? And again, this is one of the downfalls is there's no real easy way to do this, right? I, I don't know how, like when this thing was maxed, well, then what was, you know, when this was maxed, what was this, right? And is it, it there all, are they going to be a certain ratio between those things? Or when this one's maxed, what's happening with these ones, right? It's, it's really difficult to try to figure out what's happening there. And it ends up being a guess, right? And the two guessing methods that the, that the code allows for combining the modes, this is my favorite, square root of the sum of the squares, and sometimes I see it with a Q in there, sometimes you see it without, square root sum of the squares, right? And so what you do is you take these guys and you square them and you add it on to the next one squared and you add the next, the next one squared. So you do that for each one and then you take the square root of all of those things squared, okay? Square root of the sum of the squares. And same thing with the responses, right? If you went through and you calculated your Fs, right? If you went through for each one of these, calculated your Fs and which gave you your responses, even your responses, you would have to do the square root of the sum of the squares for the responses, Okay? That's all that this is saying. We could see it. Let's, let me, I'm going to copy this over here. Same thing would apply here. Right? You would get, you know, e either you do it with the S method that we talked about before or, or simply simplest stated is you'd figure out what your forces are. And in this case, these would not be functions of time. You, they'd be single points. You, wouldn't, you lose the function of time when you do it this way. That's why one of the, the problems with doing it this way, right, is one, combining modes. The other thing is you can't really see how the dampers, like if you had dampers in there and how those things interact and, and you know, keeping track of all the max displacements and stuff like that, you, you lose that when you do the response spectra analysis. But computationally, this is way easier to do, doing it, doing it using the response spectra. It saves a bunch of steps, right? This is the response spectra. This response spectra is what you would get from... USGS, same thing that you use, same exact response spectra that you use for the equivalent, equivalent lateral force procedure. That's what this is, same exact response spectra that you use. And so that in VA, that's what you do. You have to give it a response spectra. You give it a response spectra for your location, right? And then it goes through behind the scenes, calculates all your periods, pew, pew, looks over what your what your accelerations are, pew, pew, what your accelerations are, pew, pew, okay? Then it does this combination, the square root of the sum of the squares, adds them up, gives you your forces, gives you your responses, and does all that stuff behind the scenes, okay? Including adding them up. And so if you look, if you dive deep into, not too deep, but when, when you work on your homework, when you work on your homework, one of the options that uh, VA gives you is how do you want to combine your modes? They give you a little bit of uh, flexibility. One is the square root of the sum of the squares. They specifically call that out. The other one is the complete quadratic combination. This is a better one. This one, actually, they try to put a little bit of science into it, right? They try to apply a little bit of science. And what the, they do is they make this, they make this little vector so this is similar to a, this is similar to squaring it, right? R times R is kind of squaring, but then you add it in this little matrix right here. And what that thing is, uh, what do they call this thing? This is a matrix. Matrix. relating how modes <coughs> again it's very similar to the square root of the sum of the squares but they've added a little bit of science here a little bit of extra here calculating you know try to apply a little bit of how does how does this mode affect this mode affect this mode and that's what that l is doing because that's one way you can you can do it. So in VA, if you see a little what do, what uh, it says, how do you want to combine your modes? That's the difference between CQC and the SRS. And CQC is the best. We're going to use square root of the sum of squares because that you know for our example because that's just what applies here. Okay, so that's 
kind of clever, right? This is a, the key component. This is one of the grand finales of this whole thing, right? Because this combines everything, right? Central difference method for solving, this idea of response spectres and how, how we go about using them, right? Kind of see, right? I, I couldn't use the same response spectre. That's a good point. Good point, Mike. I couldn't use the same response spectra for every single mode if I didn't use the gamma deal to get rid of the scale in front of the UG double dot, right? I had to get all of my modes, a, you know, all of my modes right here equal to the same forcing function. If I didn't have it equal to the same forcing function, then I couldn't, this response spectra doesn't work for every mode. I had to get them all in the same, same uh, forcing function so that this is the solution to all the modes. And then I can look up these things from each one of those modes. Okay. All right. That's been about an hour. Let me see what else. I want to make sure we have enough time to do an example. Let's, let's just, Let's keep going. I got one more page here to go over. So equivalent forces in modal masses, right? Again, this is the easiest way to calculate what your forces are. Yeah, I, I, let's just finish this so that on Friday we can start the example. So one way to get my equivalent forces per mode, the I in this case means mode. So to get my equivalent forces per mode is I just take K times U, okay? Or another way to do it, Right? And this is kind of last lecture is where it could be uh, my modal distribution of my M times my iota, my modal distribution of my M times iota times acceleration. So this is similar to, this is similar to mass times acceleration. Right? Similar to that, because this, this SI is the modal distribution of your masses with the influence vector applied. So I can get my forces as being K times U or S times A, right? And my static analysis multiplied by my, my, my A there, okay? And so when you do it, what happens is, right, when you do that for each one of these modes, K times U, I, I would get, right, this is what's happening in mode one. I have F21 plus F11, and then F22 plus F12. So this is the first number is the floor, the second number is the mode. So this would be f floor one, mode one, floor two, mode one, floor two, mode two, floor one, mode two, okay? And so you would get it, you, this is what it would look like, right? Mode one, they both go in the same direction, right? The equivalent forces go in the same direction. The reason I want those forces, because that's what I plug into my, my structural analysis program, which then gives me moments and shears and stuff like that. And this one would be reversed because mode two usually is a wiggle. So one's going to be going one direction, one's going to be going the other direction. So it would look something like this, okay? This FI, let me say, let me type this out. FI, uh, I wanted FI, equals forces, uh, forces, oh, no, sorry, it's the force structure into shape it would be in if obtained from dynamic analysis. Right? These are equivalent forces. They're not really there, right? They're not forces that are applied to the structure, but they would be forces, right? And, and again, the whole reason we're doing this is because our structural analysis program needs it in this, in this form. And so another way to look at what those forces end up being is they're the forces that are required to push the structure into the shape that it's supposed to be in under the dynamic analysis times that UI. And so it's forcing it into that position, into that UI position, right? This is similar. This is where the forces come from in equivalent lateral force. That's, that's how they came up with that method. That's how they came up with the, this, this, right? If you recall that distribution, oh, good enough, that distribution, 
of force is up the height of the structure. It's it, it, for the most part equivalent lateral force procedure. It it is based off of mode one. It's kind of working its way up. But some of the higher modes, or when the period gets up to a certain amount, then it then it kicks in that K value, and that K value gives it more of a whip to it. The reason it whips a little bit more to it is because of this extra. This, this effect of the, the secondary mode, which adds a little bit of an extra whippy whip to it, okay? And so that, that, that's just a statement on that, okay? So then let's just keep going with this, right? Again, your SI, right? This is the distribution of your masses, right? This is M times iota, your mass matrix times iota. And, and it actually ends up being... Your S ends up being, in this particular case, in units of mass. So this is, this. think of the SI as being kind of a mass, okay? And so, again, you could, you, the way you dis, the way you break it into its different modal components is with its phi factor and its gamma factor that's out front, right? This is my forces, it's just going to gamma times M times phi I times this A out front. And if I was to calculate my base shear, Okay, let me make this clear here. All right, J is the, in this case, J is equal to the floor that you're on, and then I is equal to the mode that you're on. So if I wanted the base shear, because that's something that comes up on, on occasions, right? If I want the base shear, what is the maximum shear that's down here at the bottom? I can look at each mode, and what I do is I, for each mode, I just simply add up these things, right? So if I wanted the base shear for mode one, it's just gonna be F21 plus F11, right? So I'm so I'm looping through my J, so I, I sum up my floors, and which makes sense. If I want base shear from one, I just take this guy plus this guy, and it gives me the base shear here, okay? And then, then, or it could be thought of as being my S's. I could sum up my S's and multiply it by my, my acceleration component, my A. So I could sum up my masses vertically and then multiply it by my pseudo acceleration, right? And what this ends up being, what I call is this MI star times my, my pseudo acceleration. What, what this is assuming is this down here. I guess this is it's this is sub this is subbed in above here. I guess I kind of did this backwards, but right that that's what's happening there. So if I take my modal distribution of my S's, right, they would look they would look like this. I mean, I guess I can draw those things. Right, you would have. You could have a S11, oh, sorry, S21 and S11, and that's for mode one. And then I'd have a mode two over here. One, two over here. And then I would have, right? Signs matter, right? And I would have a, S22 two two and S12, right? This basically, it's your forces divided by your pseudo acceleration is one way to think of it, but it's just how is your, how, again, what these are is how is your mass distributed up by the, up the height of the structure, okay? And so what is this saying is, and this comes up in the code in particular, so it's kind of important to understand what's happening, is I take this guy and I add on this guy. So what my S's are is I sum them up within a mode, okay? And then that gives me the modal mass for that mode. Then I come over to the next mode and then I sum these guys up coming down and that gives me the modal mass for mode two, okay? And then when you sum up all of your modal masses, it'll equal your total mass. This is just a little thing to note. Okay, and so <coughs> that's, ha that's, that's happening behind the scenes it, or, or that's, that's, that's what's going on. And so it's one way to think of this is if I want my base shear, I guess that's what I'm building up to here. If I want my base shear for each mode, I just take my effective modal mass for that mode and I multiply it by my A from that, uh, uh, for, that for that period or that mode. Okay? And that A is coming from, it's either coming from this, right? Or it's coming from this. But I just take, I just take 
and I sum up my S's, and that gives me a modal mass. I sum up these S's, it gives me my modal mass. And the reason the modal mass is important, okay, is because the code specifically uh, talks about this. The code says, remember how the, your, your structure is, your structure is, you know, thousands of degrees of freedom, right? Especially the one that you just, you just, uh, designed, right? You have a six degrees of freedom per node. And so there's thousands and thousands of modes. How many modes do you use when you go to solve these, these, how many modes do you use when you, when you, uh, try to do the effective modal mat or sorry, to do the modal response spectrum analysis, right? How many modes do you use, right? The code addresses this. What the code does, it says code specifies that you need to use enough modes to reach effective modal mass equal to at least 90% of total mass. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at the code specifically and see what it, you know, its exact language. But it just says you have to use as many modes as possible to reach 90% of the total mass, right? And so there, you can look up in, the, in VA, it'll calculate what your modal mass is as well as you're going along. But it specifically says that you have to, you have to reach 90% of that. And, and also, by the way, I, I didn't call this, this is, this is the modal mass right here. This is the effective modal mass. When you sum your eyes up vertically, when you sum your eyes up vertically, that is what they call the effective modal mass. This they call MI star. Okay? And if you sum up all of your modal masses, you end up with the total mass. Okay? So, one thing to be careful of, right? So, this is, like I said, we're, we'll do an example and kind of step through each of these steps here in, 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 on Friday. We'll do that. Okay? But one thing to be careful of is a pitfall. And I see people fall into this pitfall all the time. Okay. And what, let me see, let me say here. Pitfall. And that is when any modes with response spectra look in I say look at response of interest in within let's say within mode first then combine I'll we'll get, I'll get, in, I'll explain that in a second here. Then combine. Right. The reason for this is you. Oh, let me say, do this. There you go. Oh, no, no, no. Then combine. Then we do this. Okay. And then what happens is we lose signs the reason we have to do this right is we lose signs when combining modes because of squares okay so let me come back to this and exp and use this diagram up above as an example so in this case right here if i was say hey what say that my response of interest is base shear that's my response of interest, okay? What I need to do first is I have to take this guy plus this guy, and then it gives me my base, base shear for mode one. Then I do this guy plus this guy, and it gives me my base shear for mode two. And then my total base shear is going to be this guy base shear squared plus this guy base shear, base shear squared, and then the square root of both of those, okay? So I have to look at base shear in each mode first, 
and then go. The problem what would be is if I went like this and I said, okay, I'm going to combine my forces. I'm going to take this guy squared plus this guy squared and give me a total force over here. I take this guy squared, this guy squared, take the square root of it, and that gives me a force at the top. I do this guy squared plus this guy squared and then and the square root of that and gives me a force up at the top. And then I tried to do my base shears if I went here plus this guy and went down. <coughs> I would lose some I, – I would, I would that would be a problem because when – it, the way you're supposed to do it is I look at I look at this first, and this one they're both going the same direction. This one one's going to the left and one's going to the right, and so this guy in terms of base shear, this guy and this guy counteract each other, and they would be result in a smaller base shear. If I combined them first, this guy gets squared, this guy gets squared, they would both result in a you know a positive one, and then this guy gets squared and this guy gets squared and it ends up with a positive one. You lose the fact that this one's going that way and this one's going this way. So this is that's the pitfall to avoid. You look you look in the mode first and then you look mode here, mode here, and then you do the square root of the sum of the square. Same thing would apply for the you know the moments and shears and stuff down here. The fact that these are acting in opposite directions will make a difference in what those moment, what the moments and shears and stuff are this column down here. So you have to look inside the mode first and then do the combination afterwards. Okay. Uh, like I said, then the next step is we're, we're going to do an example. We're going to go for a three-story example. We're going to uh, – the same three-story structure actually that you used in your homework. It turned in. We're going to apply, we're going to do a modal response vector analysis by hand, okay? And we'll do that for class on Friday. So I'll have the note set aside for that. I'll post, obviously, you'll see my announcement with this posted and the notes required for this. All right, we're almost there. An example, and then a little bit of look into the code, and then we're done. Great.